Well, I'm thankful to our uh, lay reader who, um, in skipping the canticle, gave me extra time to preach to you. So I'll just add that on to the sermon time. <laughs> you can find him in the parking lot later. Uh, <laughs> so, the text today from the Gospel of Luke. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The words of our Lord in the ESV are not as impactful in my view as the King James or authorized version which reads, And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry day and night unto him? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? The parable that Jesus tells today is one of encouragement. It's a straightforward parable, which I was grateful for as I had to prepare two sermons, one for this morning with morning prayer and one for the wedding this afternoon. It's a parable that doesn't take a whole lot of explaining, right? The plain reason, the plain meaning comes through. The characters are clear. There's a widow and there's an unjust judge, which verse tell, this verse 4 tells us fears neither God nor respects man. And if you've dug into Scripture or are a student of ancient cultures, you know that the widow in today's parable is helpless in her own right. She has no money, no protection, no legal standing. The fact that she's standing in court at all shows that she's not just a widow, but one without family, and one without advocates, and one who's extremely bold. You see, the courts of that time were solely places for men. And it's lamentable that money and or influence is often necessary to gain true justice in any justice system, both ancient or modern. Judicial systems have that in common to some degree. All she has at her disposal is justice itself and perseverance. Look at verse 3 in the Gospel lesson. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. Or in the King James, Avenge me. The second character of the parable, of course, is the wicked judge. And to say that this judge, quote, fears neither God nor respects man is to say that he doesn't care about the rule of men or God's law. Or, in our modern vernacular, perhaps, he doesn't give a rip. True justice, the Greek DK, is giving someone what they're owed. And it's the fur furthest thing from this judge's mind. He's crooked. He's wicked. When Moses' father-in-law in the Old Testament, Jethro, comes and sees Moses because Moses is overwhelmed by people coming to him asking for judgments and is the sole judge of the Hebrews, Jethro con counsels Moses to have men empowered to act as judges, instructing him, quote, Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, or fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. When King Jehoshaphat, later on in the Old Testament, appoints judges in fortified cities of Judah in Second Chronicles chapter 19, the king appointing these judges says this, Consider what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord. He is with you in giving judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or par partiality in taking bribes. 
The point that Jesus is making here, therefore, when he talks about this judge who fears neither God nor respects man, is that it's a wicked judge who doesn't love God, doesn't care about God, and certainly doesn't care about justice. And you have this situation now where this weak but persistent widow has been wronged and is at the mercy of this wicked judge. And the judge doesn't care about justice, and has no good reason to avenge her. Look at, in verse 4, the judge even admits this in the parable. Read it with me, if you would. For a while while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. How long did the persistent widow persist? How long did she persevere? We don't know in the parable. Jesus doesn't tell us. But apparently it was long enough that even this wicked judge got tired of hearing from her. And so Jesus interprets the parable for us in verses 7 and 8. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice, or he will avenge them speedily. He will give justice. He will avenge them speedily. Jesus makes an argument that was common in his time, and actually is one that we still use today. It's an argument of the lesser things to the greater things which seems like a formal logic thing that might not be familiar to you, but you do this all the time when you say things like, even my toddler gets this. Why doesn't that person? (laughs) Remember the Geico commercials? They famously used this logic back in uh, around 2009. Even a caveman can do it. Go to dico.com and sign up. Even a caveman. You remember it was a whole series and the cavemen would be offended. Do you remember that? It was a funny series. Back when they made funny commercials still, right? Um, That's an argument from lesser to greater. And what Jesus is saying here is if even this wicked judge will give justice to this woman, how much more will your loving father give justice? Of give justice to you, O church. The message to the church and to the individual Christian, therefore, is clear. Number one, God will bring justice to those who harm his chosen. And number two, we, as his chosen, as his elect, must persevere and persist in faith. Not just the faith, but in trust, trusting him with how things work out. These points are, are fairly easy to understand, but this application of this parable is where it gets tougher in my experience. For how many of us have been wronged, or mocked, or sidelined, or shunned in the midst of trying to live out our vocation, the things that God has called us to do in this world? And what's our first instinct when we're mocked or sidelined or shunned? Is it to call out to God for help? Well, I won't answer for you, but I can answer for myself. No. No. I wish it were. But my first response is not usually to say, Lord, help, I trust that you'll avenge this situation. Some of you know that Leah and I have two children One younger, Patrick, who's now able to bring about his own retribution on his older sister, Bridget, to some degree. And oftentimes, they'll be playing in the living room when all of a sudden you'll hear bonk as a metal pan hits Patrick's head. (laughs) And then you'll hear another bonk as Patrick retaliates and both come running to mom crying. That illustrates more what we're naturally doing when we face shunning or mocking or being sidelined. We don't turn to dad, our father, 
but rather we try to bring our own justice about, or we say it doesn't matter, and we go on glumly. Why is turning to our loving Father so difficult to us? Well, I think part of it is that sometimes we lack a certainty in his goodness and his justice. I can't speak for you again, but in looking at my own heart and soul, sometimes when I try to take things into my own hand, it's because I haven't trusted God with that thing. I think, well, he's going to let that person off. Or he's not going to bring about justice because he doesn't really care about that. And unless I do it, no one's going to do it. But what does Jesus say? He says that's not what we're to do. And he says, in fact, that doing that is having a lack of faith in God. St. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, chapter 12, verse 19, writes, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. We can be certain, therefore, friends, that justice will happen under the rule of the Lord. And whatever justice demands, he will see to it perfectly and handle it far better than we can, even if we think we can do better. Secondly, the gospel passage today tells us that as Christians, we must persist. The widow persists day after day, bringing her claim to the wicked judge. And even he grants justice. But God is not a wicked judge, and he's not unjust, and he does care for us very much, as we know. According to Jesus, we're not to avenge ourselves, but we're also not to just let things go, which is really kind of interesting when you think about it. How many of you were taught, just let it go? Just let it roll off of your back? Well, that's actually not what Jesus says. Jesus says, no, bring it to God. And I think he says that so that we don't become hardened. You see, the other thing that Christians do in letting things slide, mistakenly, gives injustice strength. When we don't stand up to injustice after first going to God, we strengthen injustice if we let it go completely unaddressed. So while vengeance is the Lord, is the Lord's, and not the purview of the church or the individual Christian, the Christian is not called to be passive. He's not called to just not respond. We are to bring things before the Lord. And, as in all things, we seek his will. We are publicly to identify injustices in our world. So the first thing is more evident that we're not to take justice into our own hands, but the second is less evident that we are to bring it before the Lord and not just let it go. Note, the judge does not fear God or respect man and therefore puts justice in peril. And God loves justice. Inaction is a sin against God's justice. Justice taking vengeance is a sin against God's justice. When we examine ourselves, as we did this morning in morning prayer with the confession, we examine multiple things in our hearts. But one of them is to confess the things done and the things left undone. Inaction are those things left undone. God, however, of course, is not like the wicked judge. He's always swift to act in one way or another. It's true that sometimes we don't see it, and that's why we lose heart. But verse 8 says that he will give justice speedily. He will avenge his faithful speedily. And verse 1 tells us that Jesus told this parable so that we may not lose heart, so that we may not grow weary. Our Lord Jesus doesn't want us to lose heart because we're beaten down. And so today, he's assuring you and me that God sees more than any judge and avenges better than anyone. 
And then it's not indif- and he's not indifferent to the events or the incidents that happen in our lives, which hurt us as his children any more than I would be indifferent to things that hurt my own children. But then Jesus asks with the last line, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth? Jesus asks that, and he awaits our answer. Will the Son of Man find faith on the earth? And what he's asking is, will the Christian, will the church trust him in all things, to persist in all things. Friends, let us answer him by trusting him, by bringing our issues to him as a loving father, our sufferings and our slights before him persistently, for he does delight in our persistence. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.